Welcome into Seattle Seahawks today. I am Tom Downey here to break down some rumors and at least one news item on the Seahawks. We'll begin with some free agency talk as it relates to one Chris Carson, the Seahawks' number one back. Now, Jay Keeps over in ESPN Seattle, who had said he thought for sure Chris Carson was going to stay, has now flip-flopped pretty quickly after the news of the hiring of Shane Walden and is no longer confident that Carson will return to the Seahawks. There's a lot to unpack here, so we'll break it all down. The Seahawks are in a very tricky is the word I'll use situation this offseason they don't have much draft uh, space or draft capital and they don't have much cap space either they're light on both that's not a great way to drastically improve your roster Chris Carson's coming off a pretty solid year now he missed some time four games in total but when he got the ball he played pretty well and showed he could offer more in the passing game on top of that and that's all very valuable and good for Seattle and then you throw in the fact that you know what if you lose Chris Carson and Carlos Hyde, who was not as good as Chris Carson, j j just so we're clear, your backs are Rashad Penny and DJ Dallas and Travis Homer, and uh, I don't like that all that much. Where things get even trickier, though, is just how much is Chris Carson going to cost this organization? You're looking at some of the recent running back contracts, right? Dalvin Cook and Derrick Henry and Joe Mixon. They're all getting $12 million a year. I promise you Chris Carson wants to get a contract like that. Melvin Gordon, $8 million is maybe a little bit more in the middle ground. I'm sure Seattle would offer Chris Carson the Todd Gurley $5.5 million per year. That was a one-year deal, but if it's a two-year deal, I think Seattle would love to do that. But I think Chris Carson, still on the right side of 30, and coming off in terms of efficiency, one of his better years with the Seahawks, I think there will be some significant interest in him in free agency on the open market. And you're not going to franchise tag, and that makes no sense if you're Seattle. So unless you get a deal done in advance, he is going to hit the open market. And in the event that happens, I think there's a very good chance that some team out there decides, you know what, let's give Chris Carson some money, let's make him our lead back, and he might price himself out of Seattle's range. If he wants to take a bit of a hometown discount, things work out a little bit better. Not sure Carson wants to do that after being a late-round pick. He wants to get as much money as possible as he should. So what do you guys think will end up happening? This will be the pinned comment, by the way, on today's video. So to get the ad break, scroll on down and let me know. Will the Seahawks re-sign Chris Carson? Why for yes or and for no? Let's talk offensive line now here. And yeah, this one absolutely needs help. A lot, a lot of discussion on how can the Seahawks make their team better? Well, offensive line, one of those on the offensive side of the ball, right? They didn't play great this year. Now look, part of that was injuries, but they got healthier at the back end of the season and they didn't play that great down the stretch. And not only that, Two of their starters are pending free agents. Mike Ayupati, I'm not sure he's going to be back. Ethan Posick was a nice surprise relative to what he had done the previous couple seasons, but I don't feel great about him getting a significant contract. If he's cheap, okay, again, that changes all types of discussion there. So Dwayne Brown's still a great left tackle. I liked what I saw out of Damian Lewis in round one, or in, in, in year one, I should say. Nice day two pick for Seattle. Brandon Shell is fine, but you got needs at center and left guard. So if you're Seattle and you're going, okay, how can we make this offense better? How can we make it more efficient? How can we run the ball better and pass it better? I think offensive line absolutely is one of the key areas for Seattle to address. As far as I'm concerned, it is the single biggest need this offseason. Now, Super Bowl 55 coming up, and you guys can bet on it. Chatsports.com slash bet. Use that promo code you see on screen right there. Seahawks125. It'll get you a 125% deposit bonus. Very simple math. You put down 100 bucks, they're going to give you an extra 125 for free. GameStop has nothing on that deal. Chatsports.com slash bet. At least current GameStop does not. Promo code Seahawks125. More free agency talk here, and this is the guy we haven't discussed too much in depth, and I want to start doing it more. Shaquille Griffin is one of the tougher decisions this team is going to have to make in the offseason. He is their number one corner. No disrespect to a healthy Quentin Dunbar or even a nice surprise in DJ Reed. Griffin was the best corner on this Seahawks team. Now, he was a bit banged up this year. There were moments of inconsistency. Those have kind of been in place for a while now for Griffin. 
I'm not convinced he's a true, you know, number one, top ten cornerback in the NFL, but he's a pretty good football player. And again, there were some inconsistencies when he got beat. There was a tendency to get beat pretty badly, but he's shown flashes. He's shown the ability to be a really good cornerback for you. And if you're looking at their depth chart and you go, okay, corner's a big-time need for us because Shaquille Griffin's a free agent and Quentin Dunbar's a free agent, and that would leave us Marquise Blair in the nickel and DJ Reed and Trey Flowers and. I don't like that. That's a Reed Flowers Blair trio is not going to work in the NFL. If you retain Griffin, keep Reed as your cornerback too. Okay, but where things get super complicated for Seattle is how much does Griffin get? Because this is a 25-year-old who plays a very important position in a free agency class that is not that great in terms of young cornerback options. There are some older guys, but. That's going to drive down their asking price. I don't expect Griffin to approach the $21 million or even the 19 and a half that Jalen Ramsey and Marlon Humphrey got. But I think it is realistic for him to ask for 15, 16-ish million per year. That's not in the top five. And with the way contracts work in the NFL, they go upwards. Everything rises and they'll, a smart team will structure in a way to bring the cap pit down this year, backload the deal, still get, get Griffin paid this season and have a potential number one cornerback locked in. So Griffin is a very difficult decision for Seattle. With that in mind, and I'm very curious how you guys answer here, what is the most that you would pay Shaquille Griffin per year? Of course, in millions. Let me know what you guys think there. Most you'd pay Griffin per year. Let's talk draft now. We haven't done too much draft talk, but it's fun, at least for me. How about drafting Elijah Molden, uh, the cornerback from Washington? Bleacher Report put out there one prospect every NFL team needs to grab, and they went with Molden, who I get it. He's kind of a local guy. I don't like this idea, and this is not a slight whatsoever at Molden. I, I think he is a good football player. He is worthy of a round two, or late round two, early round three pick. The past two years, he was good at Washington. That's two seasons, by the way, although I guess we'll call it season and a half because, you know, COVID, Pac-12, limited games in 2020. But five interceptions, 13 pass breakups, only two touch touchdowns. He is one of the best nickel corners, if not the outright best nickel corner in this year's draft class. And that's the problem for me. Moan's a nickel. He's too small. He's played nickel. There's a little bit of dabbling at free safety as well. He is a nickel corner. And that's fine. But... The Seahawks need outside corner help. You have Marquise Blair. He, he can be your nickel and probably is going to be the, the, the nickel next season. You have a DJ Reed who kind of reminds me of Elijah Molden sometimes who can play nickel but has proven he can be an outside corner too. So I'm, I'm, I don't want to spend my first pick on a nickel corner when I need an outside guy. Again, I like Molden the prospect a lot. But the fit with Seattle, I'm just not sure it works out. So let me know who you guys want the Seahawks to draft. And it's tricky this year. No first-round pick, but there are plenty of intriguing prospects out there. Go on down to the comments. Let me know who you want the Seahawks to draft. Another name to discuss here, this one floated out by Sports Illustrated, about Demetric Felton, who played running back and receiver for UCLA, impressed at the Senior Bowl. I liked him a lot. Think of him as the opposite of Antonio Gibson. Yes, he can play both positions, but probably going to be best as a wide receiver. I actually like this idea. Now, I don't think you can spend your second round pick on him, so you probably got to wait till round four. He may not be there at that point. But this type of player, I think, would be a nice addition to the Seahawks offense, to Russell Wilson, and it gives Shane Waldner a fun piece to play with. If I'm drafting Felton, I'm probably going to play him a lot as a slot receiver. And if I got good receivers too, if I add somebody else, oh, I can just line up Felton in the backfield too. Almost like a Naheem Hines type of role or a actually good, hopefully, Tavon Austin type of player where he lines up at receiver, lines up in the backfield, does a little bit of everything. You allow him to be a playmaker and almost a, a pure athlete for your team. I want to get another receiver if I'm Seattle, someone who I can play in the slot. I think Felton fits that mold. 
Now, the timing of where he goes might not fit for Seattle, but I do think he is an intriguing player to watch out for and gives Russell Wilson a short area of the field option, and I think that this team needs that given what we saw last year when they faced a lot more two high, single high, and, and cover two coverages. I think that short area guy would be a big boost to the offense. Now, again, we haven't done a lot of draft coverage so far, mostly because ah, there's no first-round pick and not a ton of buzz around the Seahawks draft class quite yet. But we will get there. We will do plenty of Seahawks draft videos. So if you want those, hit that big red button and subscribe. You know, make sure those notifications are turned on. That way you don't miss out on any videos. We're doing videos almost every single day for you guys. So if you want to stay updated on who Seattle could draft, and of course, once they make a decision, we'll break those down for you too. Draft grades, all that fun stuff. Hit that big red button and subscribe. Want to wrap up today's video with some Greg Olson conversation. Olson expressed uh, some buyer's remorse of joining the Seahawks instead of the Buffalo Bills. We'll get to his quote in just a second for you guys, which is interesting. I, I think part of it was Olson wanted to be with uh, on the, the best team possible. He wanted to win that Super Bowl. He thought he had a good chance with Seattle. Not how things turned out. Didn't have a massive impact this year. Here's what Olson had to say. I'm glad I still went to Seattle. So things taking a bit of a context. So he was glad, but there was some bars remorse, right? It was a good experience. I'm happy for Buffalo. I had a lot of friends there. But I'd be lying if I said I wasn't having a little bit of buyer's remorse. I would make the argument that of the two parties involved here, Seattle and Greg Olson, the party with the most buyer's remorse, frankly, should be Seattle. Because they paid Greg Olson about $7 million bucks this year and got a touchdown and, and 24 catches and less than 250 yards and good leadership and decent blocking. That was not worth $7 million. That This move, even though I frankly didn't like it at the time because you had Will Disley and Jacob Hollister and then you drafted Kobe Parkinson, you didn't need to pay Greg Olson $7 million. You could have saved that money, used it on, on a different position, I think the Seahawks would have been better for it in the end. I don't think there's any ill will between either side, between Seattle and between Greg Olson. I just think this was a move to try and make the team better that in the end didn't really pay off in the way either side had hoped for.